different company called App Press. So, so yeah, let's talk about selling WordPress products. My name is Scott. Uh, I started out in WordPress just doing a little bit of client work. I had a premium theme company that I started in 2010. In 2014, I started App Presser. In 2015, we released a new product that's a software as service. So, um, I've tried a few, several different business models in the WordPress space, and um, I'll talk about a few of those here, and hopefully, you can learn something. So, the first thing is, um, I recently wrote a post on my blog that was shared revenue statistics for over 20 different WordPress product businesses. Um, and the reason this might be interesting is because you may be thinking, well, uh, you know, how much money can I make selling WordPress products? Is it worth it? That I'm doing consulting now, I'm making good money. Is it worth looking at the product space? Um, or kind of what kind of revenue things you can expect? So uh, this post is interesting. It, it's from companies that shared their revenue st uh, statistics publicly. So it's a very small sampling of the market, and obviously it doesn't give you a window into everything that goes on in, in the WordPress space. But um, it's everything from companies that are making $2,000 a month to $5 million a year. Um, and one of the interesting things that you'll see is that you, it, there's a description of some of the business models. You can see whether people are doing like freemium, uh, free model plus paid extensions, you know, premium, whether they're selling themes, things like that. Uh, and it might just give you a little bit of a glimpse into what some of the companies in this space are doing. So does anyone uh, remember the year that Matt Mullen went to fork V2 to create WordPress? Before. So three, so two, 2003, Matt Mullenweg forked this uh, this software called B2, and he created WordPress. The first premium theme companies started in about 2007. So um, you know, there was about four or five years there where um, you know the people were just kind of using the software for free, and there wasn't a whole big premium economy um, where people were selling products and making a lot of money. What happened in about 2007 is a few people. Uh, 2007, 2008, there was a few people like Brian Gardner and um, AD and Jason Scholler, Corey Miller, some other people started releasing these premium themes and actually started making money. And that was sort of the beginning of WordPress products being something that was actually viable to do as a business. Um, Jason Scholler actually sold his first theme for $5 and he sold uh, like 100 copies within a few days and he was kind of like, crap, I should have charged more. <laughs> so um, he, he ended up raising the price to $25 and then, you know, uh, premium themes ended up, they, they kind of went all over the board for a while, you know, some anywhere between $50 and $150. Um, the very first WordPress theme ever was the, was Kubrick, which is the it was the default WordPress theme for a while. I'm sure a lot of you guys recognize that if you've been around for a while in WordPress. Um, Aveda uh, on this side is the number one selling WordPress theme on Theme Forest. This theme has made 7.8 million dollars. That one product. Yeah, and um, so it, this theme has um, okay. Why? <laughs> That's a good question. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, this theme has, I, I'm going to forget the exact numbers, it has like three or four different sliders, including like a 3D slider and all this crazy stuff. It has a short code generator. It has a whole drag and drop page builder plugin that goes along with it. It has a mega menu. Um, it has like uh, over 60 PSDs that come with it. It is basically like everything but the kitchen sink. Right. Um, so apparently, you know, judging by the sales, this is what people want in themes. And by the way, this theme is fifty-eight dollars, and the author does not. The author gets about seventy percent of that each sale on Theme Forest. Um, so themes have pros and cons, right? They, uh, when when the WordPress economy sort of started uh, coming along as something being viable in two thousand seven, two thousand eight, people were making themes. They started making a lot of money. Brian Gardner uh, started making six figures a month within his first year of selling premium themes. Um, and it, it just, people said, people saw that and they were kind of like, wow, I want to I jump in too, right? So, um, it, you know, by now the market's a lot different. So let's talk about some of the pros. Some of the pros of making themes um, are that everyone needs one. If you have a WordPress site, you have to have a theme. It could be a free theme, it could be a premium theme, doesn't matter, but you have to have one. If you think about plugins, you don't have to have any plugins. So that is one good thing about having themes. Um, a lot of people like premium themes. They, you know, it, it's, it's like a shiny new uh, paint job for your car. It's like buying a new pair of clothes. It makes you look good. You buy something, you install it, it makes you look good, right? It's, it, it's sort of a fun thing to buy. Um, they're easy to make. So uh, 
Making a theme from scratch is not easy at all. It's actually a lot more complicated than a plugin, but you don't have to start from scratch. So it's actually really easy. You can use a starter theme like underscores, or you can even fork one of the uh, one of the default themes like 2013, 2012, whatever, and just kind of put a new coat of paint on it, change the CSS, change some of the, uh, you know, change what it's called, maybe add a color picker or two in the theme options panel, and, and just like that, you have a theme that you did yourself, right? Uh, there's not, like uh, Miko was talking about earlier, there's nothing wrong with forking code in WordPress. It is actually highly encouraged as long as you, you know, do the proper attributions. So, easy to make. Um, there's no customer education. You don't have to tell somebody why they need a theme. They already know that they need a theme. They have to have one for WordPress. They already know that they want a theme because they like the way that they look, they think they're cool. So, there's not a lot of customer education as to why you need to buy one. Um, so those are the pros. Uh, let's look at some of the cons. Some of the pros are actually some of the cons. See what I did there? <laughs> so everybody needs one, only one. So that means that there's not a lot of repeat sales, at least in rapid succession. If you look at a product like WooCommerce, you can buy 10 different extensions for it all in the same purchase, all at the same time, and still buy more and more extensions. If you buy a theme, you kind of have a theme, you set it up, you like it, you probably leave it there for at least a year. And then a customer probably doesn't change their theme very often. The, the lifetime of a, of a blog or of a WordPress-based business is actually something around a year. Um, I, Syed talks about this a little bit. He knows more than I do about it. But there's not a lot of people who have WordPress-based businesses for like 10 years that are come back and buy 10 themes from you, right? You'll probably get like one, maybe two themes, unless they're a developer who's buying themes for clients. They're easy to make. That's actually a con because there's a very low barrier to entry into the market. And because of that, you have a saturated market. So when you started out in 2007, 2008, there wasn't a lot of people, there wasn't a lot of places to buy premium themes. So the like four guys who were selling them were making a ton of money. But everybody saw that, they jumped into the market, and now in 2015, you have an incredibly saturated market. There's like hundreds of theme companies out there. Um, because of that, it's very difficult to compete. So uh, the other thing is uh, marketplaces like Theme Forest have popped up and have driven the prices of themes down. Now, um, I, you know, this is not to say anything bad about Theme Forest. I'm going to be trying to be neutral about it, but they have their their model has worked very well for them. A lot of authors have made a lot of money. But if you look at the prices on Theme Forest, the the prices are, uh, you know, I think between like forty eight and fifty eight dollars or something like that. The Aveda theme is fifty eight bucks. Um, if you aren't one of the top selling authors, you're selling a product for $58, plus they're getting 50 to, uh, actually I think you, you start at 30%, they're getting anywhere from 30 to 70% of that sale. Um, even if you sell on your own site, you're still paying out affiliates, you have, uh, you know, you may be paying a support guy, you may be paying server costs, all this kind of uh, cost for your business. Uh, selling a product for $58 is not really going to be a viable business down the line unless you're one of the top guys. It's very difficult to be a top brand in the theme business these days. You need lots of themes. Theme companies have a lot of themes, and you have to make a lot of product. Whereas, let's say you have a contact form plugin, you're going to make a contact form plugin, maybe make some extensions for it, uh, you're going to work on your core product. If you have a theme, you need to keep cranking out new themes. People like shiny new stuff. They, uh, especially with themes, it's a, there's a very short shelf life for popular themes, unless you're something like a beta, which is kind of a unicorn. Um, but you need to just keep cranking out new ones because you'll, uh, I saw this in my business, when you release a new theme, it gets a lot of attention, especially if you're in a marketplace like WordPress.org, uh, it has a list for like newest themes or recently updated themes, same with plugins. Uh, so the new ones get a lot of attention and then they kind of die off. And then when you release a new one, people are like, ooh, new shiny, you know, let me see that one. And then uh, it, it gets attention. So you need to keep creating themes to continue to have a viable business, which is very difficult. It's a lot of code debt. It's a lot of uh, overhead. It's a lot of maintenance support. Maintaining old products becomes a huge, huge problem but when you've created a lot of themes, uh, which is why you see companies like Move Themes retired a lot of their old themes. Um, good distribution is tough. We're going to talk about distribution in a minute. But um, you know, there's a few marketplaces you can be on. You can be on your own site. Uh, but you know. Getting good distribution for themes is, is difficult. It's difficult to get like press or any kind of attention for a theme because themes are just old news these days. There's some people already have the themes that they like, the themes that they want. If you're a Genesis guy, you're going to stick with Genesis. You're not looking for a new theme company. You know, if you're going to buy a theme from Theme Forest, then that's a whole different type of customer, and they're not looking for the newest theme shop that's selling themes on their own site. So it's <laughs> difficult. So. Um, 
Let's talk about another way you can sell WordPress products, which is plugins. Because a, a lot of successful plugins, um, actually if you look at the revenue statistics post that I put on my blog, most of the, the products on there are, are plugins. Um, and you don't see a lot of theme companies on there. That's mostly just because those are the only companies I could get revenue statistics for. But I do think that it's reflective of where the WordPress economy is these days. It used to be the, the fact that you could not make money selling plugins if your life depended on it. Like in 2008, nobody would buy a plugin. Everybody said, you can't make money selling plugins. All the money is in themes. Everything's plugins should all be free. And they were. And then the only thing you can make money with is themes. And that was true for several years. And now it seems like everything's flip-flopping. Um, Woo Themes was one of the, or there is one of the major theme companies that was one of the early on front runners. Um, and they actually, when they released WooCommerce, WooCommerce became 80% of their revenue, and they were already a multi-million dollar theme company. And then Woo WooCommerce is, uh, it's probably more than 80% at this point, that's a, that's a fairly old statistic. Uh, of course, they got acquired now, so things may be totally different now. Um, but let's look at you know pros and cons of plugins. You can have more than one per site. So like I was saying with uh, extension model, easy digital downloads, you can, they can be repeat customers. You can buy multiple extensions over and over, put it on the same site. Um, you can have more than one on the same site, whereas with the theme, you can only have one. So that's a, a very limited market. So you automatically have a larger market because you can have more than one plugin per site. A plugin, a plugin is just a product. It's something that solves a problem. So uh, products that solve problems are evergreen. That means that they're not going to be a fad that kind of comes in and out. A theme is, uh, not to diminish anything that theme authors are doing, they're doing a lot of really cool stuff, but uh, when you look at, the way that customers look at themes is that it's a design, it's something that looks cool. They don't really think like, oh, this is like the most secure, like best coded theme I've ever seen and I'm gonna buy it for the code. No one buys themes for the code, except for like developers, right? They buy it for how many like bells and whistles it has and, and what it looks like. With a, with a plugin, um, it's different, it's a product. Uh, a lot of people say that themes were a gold rush, and, and they kind of were. The reason that themes were a gold rush is because uh, there was such a low barrier to entry, right? When you, if you're a gold miner, you go to the, uh, you know, you, you come to California, you try to strike gold, all you do is you buy, you know, some Levi's, and you buy, <laughs> <laughs> and you buy a pan, and you get a plot on the river, and you start mining for gold, right? That's kind of what themes are. You just do exactly what the last guy did, you just copy him. You say, I'm going to be a theme designer. I'm going to fork this themes code. I'm going to use underscores, whatever. Change the design a little bit, and I'm going to be, and all of a sudden, I'm a premium theme shop. Boom, you know? The, the thing with plugins is that it's not like that. You actually have to solve a problem. You have to actually have to do something unique. Of course, you, you, you can fork someone else's code or just something similar, but it's, it's not the same thing. Um, plugins also offer better pricing models. You can do free plus extensions, like WooCommerce, easy digital downloads, Ninja Forms. Um, you can uh, you can do just straight premium uh, like Gravity Forms. You can uh, you can do higher prices like uh, with my company AppPressor. Uh, our most popular bundle is five hundred dollars. Try selling a theme for five hundred dollars. <laughs> Good luck, you know. Um, and and the reason why is because you are helping someone solve a problem that makes them money or saves them time. And if you're doing that, then you know it's worth that. So uh, you can also do recurring business, uh, recurring uh, and things like that, but recurring is more of a SaaS thing, so we'll get into SaaS in a little bit. Uh, some of the cons. Solving real problems is difficult. You know, forking a theme and changing the CSS is really easy. Uh, coming up with an idea for a plugin and uh, a distribution model and marketing and actually making it go is very difficult. Uh, so that's definitely a con. There's a lot more customer education. Uh, my product makes mobile apps with WordPress. Most people have no idea how that works, and so we have to educate them a lot, and there's a lot of support, and there's a, a lot of education we need to do, which is time consuming, it's difficult, it's, it adds overhead, it adds to your cost per uh, customer acquisition, um, and, and, and you know, it's, it's one of the cons of selling plugins. So another model is software as service. Uh, there's a lot of companies in WordPress already doing this, and I think it's becoming more popular these days. 
Uh, if you don't know what software as a service is, it basically means that you are hosting um, everything on your site and people are paying you basically a monthly fee to access your servers and, and everything that you build, everything that you do is on their servers. So uh, an example would be like Kissmetrics, which is analytics. You, you go to their site, they, they give you code to put on your site that gets the analytics, but all the analytics get reported back to them. You log in and you check on your analytics and you make tweaks and things like that, but you are paying them monthly for access to their software that's on their servers. Um, so there's a few companies doing this really well right now in WordPress. Managed WP is one. Uh, <coughs> Vault Press, Code Schedule, Optin Monster. Optin Monster is an interesting story uh, because they actually built a software as a service platform for like eight months and then they found out that it wasn't going to work, so they scrapped it. And then in 30 days, they built a WordPress plugin, launched it, it became very successful, and then now they just built a SaaS again and split switch back to SaaS. Because they always wanted to be SaaS, they just couldn't make it work at first. Uh, but Syed uh, Balki, he has a really, he has some talks on that that you can find that are really interesting. So, software as service is one thing that's really cool because it's multi-platform. So um, one thing that I think that all of us in the WordPress community need to think more about is other things besides WordPress. Um, this may not be the most popular thing to say at a WordCamp, but, um, but there's, a, there's a whole web out there that is not using WordPress, right? WordPress is 24% of the entire internet, which is huge. It's, it's, the large, it's the most popular way to make a website you know, by far. It's the most popular CMS. Uh, it, it's used by a lot of people. But that's less than 75% of the internet. Think about that. That's less than 75%. So if you focus only on WordPress, you are missing 75% of the market. Now, that's not to say that you can't do very well only in WordPress. A lot of people are doing very well only in WordPress. There's a lot of things to be said about focusing on a niche, and, and you know, WordPress is a niche, and that can do very well. So um, it's not to say that that's wrong, but Opening up to other platforms can be a really, really good way to increase your uh, earning potential. So if you look at a company like Sakuri, uh, they do security for websites. They started out in the WordPress industry. They are a multi-million dollar company now and WordPress is only 30% of their business. So their earning potential increased uh, by a lot just by moving <coughs> to the right platform. Uh, I would say the same about Optin Monster. I think that they increased their earning potential you know, at least four times. I, I, that's, I just made that up, but it's, it's a lot. Um, so there's a much larger market. It's also a controlled environment. So when we released our software as service product called Reactor, um, which helps people build mobile apps with WordPress, we are able to actually control the environment from front to back to make everything better and easier. When you are releasing a plugin, you are have to deal with all kinds of stuff like server issues and plugin conflicts and all kinds of weird stuff that people have installed and have done on their site, and you can't control any of that. So you basically have to make a product that's just going to work for everybody, um, which in some ways is good, but then there's a lot of things that you can't do. There's a lot of variables that are out of your control. There's a lot of things that um, just aren't possible doing it that way. So building a, a software service platform you can actually control exactly how the customer is onboarded, everything that they see each day, um, you know, how everything is deployed and, and controlled, um, and that really helps a lot, in, in uh, at least for us and for a lot of products. Software as a service doesn't come without its challenges. As I've been learning, I kind of thought, hey, you know, recurring revenue is awesome, right? So software as a service, it's, it's the ticket. Do software as a service, uh, you get recurring revenue, your business is gonna explode. Um, it's, it's not quite like that. Software as a service has some really, really unique challenges that are a lot different than selling products. So for example, when you sell a product to someone, they come to your site, they, you know, they, they see your marketing materials, you educate them a little bit, they say, hey, I think this is gonna work for me, and they buy it. Um, once they buy it, that is, uh, you know, that you get the money from them, you, the transaction is done. Um, at that point, the customer is invested in your product, they will put a lot more time into learning it because they've already paid you all that they're going to pay you, basically, unless they re do a yearly renewal. And then, um, you know, that's kind of it. Some people ask for refunds, but, you know, for the most part, that's, that's, that's the way it works. With software as a service, you're dinging them every month, unless you, you have yearly fees or you have monthly fees. If you're, if you're getting their credit card every single month, they're going to look at their credit card statement every single month and say, man, 
is that really worth it? Do I really need it? Like, you know, I gotta buy my kids Christmas presents this month, or like, you know, I just I just bought this bounce house for my kid's birthday, and my credit card savings is looking a little rough this month. Like, do I really need this? And you know, say you're charging, like in, in my case with Reactor, you know, we have a we have a, a plan for fifty dollars a month. So with that presser, people pay us five hundred dollars up front, and then they get our suite of tools, they learn it, they use it, everything's great. With Reactor, you pay fifty dollars a month. Um, so how many months do they have to be in Reactor for them to get to $500, which I would have got with AppPressor? Um, it's, it's, it's a long time. And um, so to convince them every single month that they need to stay so that I get that lifetime value out of that customer is very difficult. Uh, the, with software as service products, it, 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 I think you know, most, cu most customers don't stay for more than a year. So um, yearly billing can help with that as well. But um, you know, you've got to deal with not only uh, the recurring billing and convincing customers to stay, you have to actually build the app itself. So with Reactor, we actually have, we, you're able to build an app. So we have that product, right? We have to make all these files and all, do all this stuff to help you build an app. And then we have to build an app that helps you build an app. So we actually have the Reactor itself website where that has the whole thing, like the, the marketing materials, the payment process, the membership stuff, the whole app builder, so you're essentially maintaining two different products, right? So uh, not only that, but then you have to handle the onboarding flow. So you know it, you have something like a free trial that you want to upgrade to a paid plan. Well, now you have to build in all this stuff where the free trial is so incredibly awesome that you're going to get all these people to, to upgrade, as many people as possible to pay you to upgrade, um, which is a whole different thing. And you have to have all these educational materials and all this kind of stuff. And then you have people that churn, which means that they, uh, they will cancel. So when people cancel, you might think, you know, if I have a software or service business, people are paying me $50 a month. If I get 20 people to sign up this month and 20 people cancel, then I'm flat. Uh, the reality is you're actually losing money when that happens. So due to the cost of customer acquisition and your, you know, your hosting costs and your support costs and all that kind of stuff, to, to actually stay flat, you have to have more people sign up than cancel every single month. So say I have 30 people sign up and 20 people cancel, I'm actually flat that month. I'm not growing at all, that's 0% growth. So uh, considering that, you have to actually get a lot of people to sign up and to stay. You have to reduce churn, you have to you know, increase conversions from free trial to paid, um, all these kinds of things. You have to worry about server costs and uptime, um, all these kinds of things. So. All that said, uh, you know, it, it's not that SaaS is bad, it's just that it has a lot of really unique challenges that I'm definitely still learning, um, but it's, it's not a, a magic bullet. You know, none of, these, none of these models for selling products are a magic bullet. Um, I think that uh, you need to decide what's best for your product. I think there's just pros and cons of each. You should just be aware of all of them. So now that let's, let's assume you have you know a product that you're thinking about, you thought about the business models, you picked one out. Um, now you're going to have to figure out how to actually market this plugin, how to actually sell it, right? So before you launch the product, let's let's skip backwards a little bit. Before you actually launch the product, there's a few things that you want to keep in mind um, that are very very important. When you're building a product, you want to build an MVP, right? But not, not that kind of MVP, this kind of MVP, right? So you want to build a minimum viable product. I'm sure most of you are familiar with that term, um, but there's a couple important points about this. Minimum viable product means that basically it is the least amount of product you can build to launch it and actually have something that people will buy and use. The emphasis here is on viable, it's not on minimum. So you don't want to just build a piece of crap with no features and launch it because someone told you you should build a minimum viable product, right? You, the emphasis is on viable. You have to have something that people are actually going to use and buy um, and is actually going to be useful to them. But the important part is that you, you want to stop there. You don't want to build in every single feature that you think would be cool. You know, Our tendency as developers is to have these uh, conferences with each other, like, man, wouldn't it be cool if we did this? Like, man, I just built this feature, it would only be a few more lines of code to just add this other thing, and it would be so easy, and let's just throw this thing in, and let's do this other feature, and oh man, uh, you know, this one guy asked me for this feature, and we should probably just throw it in, because if he asked for it, probably other people want it. And you tend to just build this giant behemoth, right? And especially as a developer, 
uh, you know, you're good at writing code. You're not necessarily good at figuring out when you hit minimum viability, right? It's a, it's a really difficult thing. So, um, you know, the, the point is to, <laughs> sorry, <I'm dumb> to <laughs> so the point is to build something that's minimally viable and launch it soon. Um, my personal experience with building products, I think that you should have about a three month, a three month development and, and release cycle. Um, all the products that I've built, it's taken about three months or so to build them, um, and, and then we released, and then after releasing, uh, then you can actually build more features. You can find out how people are using your product, what they like about it. Um, I don't think that you should sit with your head in the sand and build some giant behemoth product for a year and, and before launching it. I just, I, I mean, I'm, there's certainly exceptions to the rule, I just don't think that's a good idea at all. Um, I think three to six months is a really good uh, launch and development cycle. So another thing that everybody wants to do when they're building a product is they want to keep it really secret. I am totally guilty of this as well. Um, you know, it, you have an idea and you want to implement it and you want to get it out before anyone else has it and you think, man, this is the greatest idea ever. If anyone else hears about it, then uh, this, is what, this is what they're going to do. They're going to steal my idea. <laughs> You know, like people are just sitting around like waiting to hear an idea and then they're just going to jump on it and start building it. And they're going to get to it before I do and then I'm going to be screwed, right? So when you tell people your idea, so everyone I talk to about it is going to have to sign an NDA and I'm going to tell, put all these like big bold type in all my emails, which I did, and say, don't share this with anyone, you know, please, like just keep this a secret. So what, what really happens when you tell someone about your idea is something more like this. <laughs> <laughs> you have no idea how little people care about your idea. Really. Ideas are so cheap and they are so ubiquitous that nobody has time to steal your idea. Nobody cares about your idea. You know, you could say the greatest thing ever, man, I'm gonna make the I'm gonna make the, the Facebook for fitness. Cool. Like you probably think that is like the raddest idea ever and it's gonna make a billion dollars. I have no idea what that means. Like, I, I have no interest in copying that. I, I don't care if you tell me like the greatest idea ever. Um, you know, a lot of the, these businesses that are making billions of dollars now, uh, you know, they sounded like horrible ideas at first. Look at Elon Musk. Pretty much everything Elon Musk did was a horrible idea. Like, who? There hasn't been a, a car startup since I think Chrysler was the last car startup, which was in. 190 something, and Elon Musk is like, yeah, I'm just gonna start this car startup, and it's gonna be electric cars, which no one has ever done well before, so I, not only do I have to figure out the car, I have to figure out the batteries, and I have to like compete with all these big car companies that are gonna send me lawsuits and try to kill me before I even start. Not only that, but I'm also gonna try to colonize Mars at the same time. <laughs> it's, like, it's like the dumbest thing ever, right? But the guy's, the guy's super intelligent or something. I think, I think he learned how to program stuff into his brain without telling anybody, and he's like, I'm just going to do all this stuff before I tell anybody that I learned how to do that. So anyways, not only do people not care about your idea, but they also don't have time to copy it. I mean, you would be surprised. Most people are so consumed with what they are doing and the businesses that they are in that they do not have time to, to do anything with your idea. They barely even have time to give it a second thought, much less copy. So. The, the problem with keeping your idea a secret is that you're shooting yourself in the foot uh, by not getting the word out early. Um, I'm going to talk about that a little bit later, so I'll just stop there. Um, minimal features, we talked about this with a little bit uh, with the minimum viable product. Uh, you know, as developers, we just we have this tendency to just, man, build feature after feature. We're like, man, my product is only going to be good after I build this next feature, because it sucks right now, but when I get this new feature in, man, it's gonna be awesome. And you know, Chris Lima does a, a, did a great post or video or something about, you know, your product doesn't need another feature. Um, it's so true, it's really hard as, as the product developer to, to like not think about features, but um, you know, I'm, I gotta keep going here. But don't, don't, make, don't make features launch, hear what your customers and the market has to say about your product, because if you spend a year building this huge giant product, and nobody ends up using it, then you just wasted a whole bunch of time where you could have launched in three months with less features, figured out what people really wanted, built those <laughs> features in, and then within a year you would have been making money. So, um, but once you have a product and everything, let's talk about marketing that product. In the WordPress world, I think that the number one way to market a plugin is through the WordPress.org repository. Um, if you look at the stats for easy digital downloads, Pippin gets over 500 downloads on a bad day. His, his average downloads are probably more like a thousand. 
Um, I have had themes and plugins both on the WordPress.org repository. It is a great free way to get distribution. Um, one of the, there's a couple different models you can use. One is yeah, having a free plugin with paid extensions, or you can also have an upsell plugin. Um, upsell plugins look like this, like the related post for WordPress plugin, where you basically have a free version with limited features, and then on the settings page or somewhere in there you say, hey, you want more features, click here to upgrade, see how much it is, all this kind of stuff. You can do the same with themes. Um, I've done that before, it's, it's fairly successful. People do actually buy through this, and if you get a lot of downloads, it can actually be a very viable business model. Um, using free plus paid extensions is the same kind of a thing, where you have a free product that has a certain amount of features, you start using it, you really start liking it, you say, hey, what about this other feature? You go kind of search the website, oh, well, I can get that feature for you know $49, cool. Um, this is a really great way to get marketing for your plugin. Um, Another thing is content. Uh, a lot of very, very successful businesses have been built off of almost nothing else besides content alone. Um, if you look at Kissmetrics, uh, Groove, Neil Patel is, is Quick Sprout is actually not a company, but it's just his blog. Um, a lot of companies have actually just their number one customer acquisition channel is their blog, and they put just amazing content on their blog. They do really big things. Um, with their content, and they become multi-million dollar businesses mostly through their blog. If you read Groove's blog, it's GrooveHQ.com. Um, you can go to their blog. Uh, you'll see that their number one customer acquisition channel is their blog. They, they, do, they sell support desk software. They do not talk about support desk software at all on their blog. They talk about their business, how they're building their business. They talk about their revenue metrics, things like that. And they attract other business owners. Those business owners develop trust with them, and then they end up saying, oh hey, by the way, it looks like this company sells support desk software. I didn't even know, and I've been reading their blog for like a month, and so hey, maybe I'll check that out. That's the number one customer acquisition channel. So content is huge. Now some people will tell you that blogging every day is the way to go. Um, you know, I think blogging every day is great. In my experience, that has not been the, the best way to get traffic. Um, what I see is that if I, create, if I spend a lot of time creating a really valuable piece of content, my traffic does this. That is, that's stats from my blog. So um, if, if I were to write a blog post every day that was fairly mediocre, um, think about how many blog posts and how much content you see like in your Twitter, your Facebook feeds every day. It's like you see all of this stuff and all of it looks the same. But if you see a piece of content that actually looks different, like these guides, the moz.com Be beginner's guide to SEO, there's this giant guide to SEO that has all this content, all this design, it's beautifully done, it's very comprehensive. Something like that is something I'm actually going to share, and I'm going to take I'm going to take time out of my day to make sure that I share it because it's so valuable and it's so cool to me. And so what I've seen with my with my own sites is that the more time I spend on stuff like this, you get a permanent boost in traffic. Not only do you get this spike, but you'll see that this line up here is higher than that line down there. And so it's a per and it stays like that way permanently. So spending time in content, I just can't emphasize enough that you should for sure be spending time in content. Um, Affiliates are, are a decent way to get traffic too. Um, I'm not a super good affiliate guy. I've had some success with it. There's a lot of low quality affiliates, so just make sure that you manually um, actually sort through them and make it kind of um, difficult to be an affiliate. Don't accept coupon sites and you know people in China and stuff. Um, so a few final tips. Build interest, not just a product, and do it early. Build relationships with people, and uh, before you actually build a product or while you're building your product, that means talking to people um, on Twitter, in person, whatever it is, and say, hey, I'm building this like widget customizer plugin. I think it's going to be cool. You know, What do you think? Would you think that this is useful? Uh, what would you suggest for me? Can you help me out at all? And don't be like a burden to someone, but just kind of introduce the idea that that's what you're working on. Um, the reason why this is so powerful is that if you were to release a new product, and you come to me for the first time and you say, or let's, let's say Chris Lemme. Say Chris Lemme has a really influential blog, gets a lot of traffic, I want him to write about my product. So I just released this widget customizer plugin. Hey Chris, check out my widget customizer plugin, give you a free license, you know, put it on your site. He'll, he'll probably be like, you know what, I, I don't have time for this, I don't know, like, it looks kind of cool, whatever. I go on to this other thing I'm doing. But if you were to come to Chris, like, three months while you're building your product and say, hey Chris, you know, what do you think about this product? What do you think I should do with it? Pay him for consulting. Say, Chris, hey, I, I, I need your help with this. I'm gonna pay you for this. Then when you release your plugin, you're gonna say, hey Chris, 
remember that plugin you helped me with? Well, I added this thing you told me to do and that thing you told me to do. And then Chris is going to go, cool, man, I'm going to check that out because he's invested in it. And he actually helped build that product because he gave you some advice. And then he's going to write a blog post about it and say, check out this new widget customizer plugin, you know, because he's actually invested in it. And I can't tell you how powerful it is to just send one email, have one conversation with someone and, and mention this, this kind of thing to them. And it, it, it will just do so much for you at, as opposed to just kind of cold emailing, cold calling, cold talking to people about your product. You have to do this while you're building your product, before it's built, before it's launched. That's a big thing. Write about what you're doing. Blog about it. Even if you suck at blogging and your blog post is going to be two sentences long, it doesn't matter. It's better than not doing it at all. Your blogging is gonna suck when you first start. It doesn't matter. Just do it. It's gonna get better, you know? Like, if you're building this plugin and you're like, hey, I, I was working with the settings API today, I found this really cool thing, write about it. Like, if you don't have to sell your product, you just write about something. Like, I was build I'm building this widget customizer plugin, I was messing with the settings API, here's what I found out, cool, publish, done. Like, do it, blog. Um, make sure there's a market, I didn't talk about this much, but, um, you know, you, if you're building these like real super devy plugins and you know you're like I want to like integrate the Salesforce API for like fitness trainers in London then and make this plugin for it it's like cool I'm sure that's really useful for like four people but you know you're not gonna make any money off of it um, and you know make sure that there's a market for it um, you don't want the market to be too big you know if you're gonna go after the e-commerce market that's cool like good luck but that's probably too big of a market too broad there's already some really big e-commerce players that can be really hard to challenge but if you do something like GiveWP did where they said hey we're gonna do e-commerce but we're gonna do it for nonprofits and so um, you know they kind of found a subset of that niche and then um, they kind of went after it which is cool um, again we talked about with software as service where the, the internet market is bigger than just the WordPress market but think about like the this is the internet market this is the WordPress market and then if you get a tiny subset of the WordPress market this is your market right so think about that before you build the product build something that a lot of people are going to use because you'll be glad you did once you start making money because then you'll actually have somewhere to go with it instead of like hey I'm, I'm making five grand a month cool but that's all it's ever going to do um, you know, that's not really going to do much in the long term. So, that's it. I'm Scott Bollinger. Find me on Twitter.